Good morning and welcome to Cheryl Lindau, Legislative Candidate from District 17. Thank you, Cheryl, for joining us for our virtual Legislative Candidate meetings. My name is Gina Raglan and with us today are lead AARP advocacy volunteers, Dave Holmquist, who is our state president, and Danny DeLong. Emily Wick is also joining us from the AARP state office. Cheryl, we appreciate your taking the time to meet and discuss issues of importance to the 50 plus voter and their families across Nebraska. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be shared with AARP members across your district prior to the election. Cheryl, if you want to start us off by giving us a little background about yourself and your campaign, and again, aiming for five minutes or less. And once we've completed your opening, we'll move into the questions. So thank you again for joining us and go ahead, Cheryl. Okay, um, I'll start out by <clears throat> saying that I, I live in Wayne, Nebraska. Um, that's part of the three county district 17, which includes um, Dakota, Thurston and Wayne counties. A Little bit about my background. I was a political science major in college, graduated from UNL. Um, I have a master's degree in public administration from UNO. Um, I'm a former small business owner. I had a retail clothing store in Wayne at one point. Um, I also have 18 years of municipal government experience. I was on the city council for two terms here in Wayne and served as the mayor for 10. Um, I also served, while I was mayor, I also served on the Nebraska League of Municipalities board and was president of that organization for a year. Um, I also served two terms on the Nebraska State College Board of Trustees, and I was appointed by governors of both parties in that position. Um, at one point, I left, I left Wayne uh, and moved to Omaha for about 14 years in 2004, and I came back to Wayne in 2018. While I was in Omaha, I worked for Big Brothers Big Sisters, um, nonprofit organization serving youth at risk and I was also a volunteer in that program. I was a big sister for over eight years. So um, I retired in 2015. So I am a senior myself and um, over 65 and all the things that go along with that. So um, I am familiar with <laughs> I'm, I'm a lucky senior, I have to say, but I'm also familiar with um, many of the difficulties that seniors face in our society. I have an elderly mother who is still able to live independently on her own in Lincoln. So um, that's kind of the quick of my background. Great, thank you, Cheryl. And thanks for sharing your background with us. Uh, again, we provided you with a set of three questions pertaining to the 50 plus in Nebraska. Again, we've allotted five minutes for each of those questions. Um, and our first question today comes from Dave Holmquist, again, our state president, and he, it's about helping people stay in their homes and communities. So go ahead, Dave. Good morning, Cheryl. Thank you for joining us today. Um, a livable community is one that is safe and secure, has housing that is affordable. In other words, no more than 30% of income is spent on housing. Transportation options that allow individuals to travel by multiple means and support of community features and services for people of all ages, allowing people to remain in their communities as they age. What steps will you take to ensure all Nebraskans have access to livable communities? Okay. Well, I think uh, many of the same principles that apply to make a community livable for seniors also apply to you know, children and families uh, wanting to live in rural Nebraska as well. Uh, particularly for seniors, I, you know, we're lucky in Wayne. We have, we have, um, I think, fairly good um, services for seniors. We have senior citizen center. We have a nice library. Um, I think some of the services that are key to helping people stay in their homes are, you know, meal deliveries or Meals on Wheels if they're not able to, you know, get to a senior facility. Maybe a couple times a week to share a meal in a community setting. Um, it's also important to have um, adequate food and especially in, in a pandemic, I think access to supplemental food benefits, SNAP benefits. I was really disappointed to hear that our governor is not extending SNAP benefits um, during the pandemic. I think that is something that not only uh, children and families benefit from, but seniors as well, to make sure that they have um, 
healthy, adequate food. Um, also, you know, whatever the state can do to support um, senior housing living facilities that are affordable for people to be able to still remain uh, living independently. Um, handy van services, I, we, we do have those in Wayne so that people have a way to get to their doctor appointments um, and still remain in their homes. And I think um, we need to encourage uh, people to go into, you know, the supportive health care services that um, seniors need to remain in their homes, you know, to be able to have someone come in and help them with daily care, whether it's housekeeping, light meals, um, so that they can remain in their homes and not, and, you know, put off for as long as possible going into a long-term care facility, which, you know, can be pro prohibitively expensive. Um, for people. And I think, you know, we need to make sure that we protect Medicare and Social Security benefits so that people have the adequate supports to, you know, tide them through when they when they are retired um, and be able to access the services that they need. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay. Um, our second question, we're going to switch a little bit, the, and they, these all kind of overlap, I think, in, in many ways, but this question will come from Danny DeLong, and it addresses health, caregiving, and home and community-based care. So go ahead, Danny. Hi, Cheryl. The, uh, yeah, some of the, a couple of the items you've talked about are, are represented in this question, and we we'll want to kind of expand that. Um, Caregivers help older persons live independently at home by providing assistance with activities like bathing, dressing, and performing complex medical nursing tasks, such as administering medication and wound care. Caregivers often provide these services with little or no training. Uh, this is a two part, these are two questions here. First question, will you support helping caregivers with paid leave respite services, paid service, expand paid services and supports, and financial security that'll, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back. Let me start over, I apologize. Yeah. Will you support helping caregivers with paid leave, respite services, telehealth, and access to education and training? And then do you want me to give you the second question or wait till you answer that one? Maybe I'll answer this one first. Oh. Um, I, I do support paid family leave. Um, I think, you know, possibly another thing that might help um, is, you know, again, raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour so that um, caregivers that are, that are in that field make, make sure that they are able to make a living wage. Um, and I think at the education and training, like in Nebraska, I think you know, we could take, maybe take better advantage of our um, community college services um, for, to, to help encourage people to go into the field, um, provide them with some educational supports, um, whether it's if they need like a student loan forgiveness or some kind of program like that, that if they go into the field and work with seniors, you know, they could get their education um, paid for, you know, if they're in an underserved area or some kind of program like that. Um, I know there's, I think facilities and companies that are in that business may have a difficulty recruiting people into that field. And I think if some incentives were provided, you know, perhaps we could help, help with that. Um, was there another part of that question that I didn't answer? No, I think you've gotten it and uh, uh, I think you've expanded it well. Um, how will you protect uh, and expand paid services and supports and financial security that allows seniors to live independently in their homes and communities? Um, another thing that I have thought of is, you know, just to number one, make sure that the state is providing you know, adequate support in their role, um, and also um, ensuring that people, you know, could, could get a tax credit if they are a care provider for someone in their family, you know, which would help help them if they're, you know, not able to work because they need to um, stay at home and, and take care of a family member. Um, 
and also I want to make sure that um, in, you know employers are are providing you know the safety precautions for their employees and things like that, particularly during COVID, to um, work safely and stay protected and also protect the people that they are caring for. Great. Thank you, uh, at, the, at the beginning, at the beginning of your second answer, just real quickly here, you, were you saying you thought the state needed to provide adequate rural community support? Was that what your yes? Uh, well, I mean the whole state. You know, I mean we have seniors everywhere, and you know, so I, I mean, of course, I'm going to be representing a rural district, but we need to make sure seniors everywhere in the state um, have adequate services. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And our last question, and I'm actually going to address that one, we'll, switches into nursing facility quality. Um, an estimated 6,600 Nebraskans reside in one of Nebraska's 211 nursing homes. Um, research projects say by 2040, um, they project that number will more than double to almost 14,000. Due to a variety of factors, uh, we've had a lot of facilities in the state that are unable to continue their operations. They've closed. Um, through receiverships, and there are many more that are anticipating having to close because of staffing and funding issues. Uh, so how will you ensure that Nebraska residents receive quality nursing home care, including ensuring an adequate nursing workforce, education and training, as well as proper reimbursement? Well, I'm sure that nursing homes are in a lot of the same position as rural hospitals. Um, making sure that, you know, and, and a lot of this has to do with probably federal dollars, but, you know, ensuring that they have a reimbursement rate that is fair if they are taking care of a lot of patients that are either on um, Medicaid, Medicare, making sure that they have adequate reimbursement so that they can cover their costs and they are not saddled with uncompensated care. Um, you know, we need to have you know, strong rural hospitals and rural, you know, long-term care facilities to take care of our people. Um, I think, um, on the other hand, we also need to ensure that long-term care facilities are, um, you know, taking care of patients in, in a safe way and that there's adequate oversight and uh, supervision of their operations and um, inspections and and making sure that um, they are using safety protocols to take care of their their people and you know the the state oversees that and so we need to make sure that those agencies are, are funded adequately so that they can do their job and, and protect people. Um, Okay, I know that was a long question. I probably didn't make it through all the part. I should have had the question right in front of me. That would have. Yeah, and it, they are jam-packed questions. And, and <laughs> yes, there's a, but I think you've done a great job in touching on the main points of what we were looking for, Cheryl. And certainly, you okay. know, yeah. obviously this is just a first step. And as we, as, as people get into the legislature, there's definitely room for us to have follow-up. So thank you for your answer to that. And, and we are coming to the end of our meeting. So I'd like to offer you the final minutes to offer any closing thoughts or comments that you might have or messages you want to send to the constituents in your district. So go ahead, uh, Cheryl. Okay. Well, um, I, I just want to say I, I'm a person who, um, you know, in, in making decisions, I, I do have quite a bit of political experience in my background, and I've always um, made a point to listen to people on all sides of an issue and study an issue. I don't, I don't make snap judgments. Um, I think it's really important to study all the ramifications of, of any policy that you're looking at. Um, but my, my overriding, I, I think, decision-making strategy is to, I, I, I look out for the little guy. I think, you know, um, I, the people who are disadvantaged, um, who maybe don't have a strong political voice, I want to make sure that um, they are taken care of, regardless of the fact that they may or may not have a lot of political power or a strong voice in the legislature. So um, I guess that's why I, I, you know, education is, is such an important part of, you know, my play, 
political priority, taking care of vulnerable people, whether it's the handicapped, disabled, seniors, um, children and families, working people that are just trying to um, better their lives. So those are the my overriding priorities, I guess you could say. And, that, and that's who I want to work for and who I want to protect. And and um, I, like I say, I'm I'm open-minded and I am open to new solutions to problems. I guess that, you know, in my past life as an elected official, those were the things that excited me as people that came up with new and creative ideas to solve problems. It doesn't have to come from me. I can get on board with anyone else's great idea. It's not about taking credit for anything. So, um, I, I would do a wonderful job in the legislature and work very hard for the people I represent, whether they voted for me or not, so. Great, thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, and again, th we thank you for taking the time to visit with us today. We wish you the best with your campaign. And most importantly, thank you for meeting with AARP Nebraska. We okay, thank you. Take I care. wish you thank all the best you. today. Thank Thanks. you.